Good morning, brothers and sisters, and a warm welcome and greeting to all guests and visitors worshiping here among us this day. The Council has the following announcements. Damien DeRoches is requested to publicly profess his faith, and after examination, consistory with thankfulness could grant this request. If no lawful objection is brought forward, the public profession of faith and baptism will take place on August 13 in the morning worship service. Services will be held, the Lord willing, this evening at Keir Care and Hillcrest Homes in the evening at 6.30 and 7.30 respectively. The consistory announces that Damien DeRoches and Nancy Sandek have indicated their intention to enter into the married state according to the ordinance of God. They desire to begin this holy state in the name of the Lord and complete it to his glory. If no lawful objection is brought forward, the ceremony will take place on August 19, the Lord willing. The Council will meet the Lord willing on Tuesday evening at 8 o'clock p.m. And the deacons will meet this week on Monday evening at 8 o'clock p.m. And our offerings today are for the work of uh, Mission Prince George, I believe. With that in mind, let us now go to, now to, let us rise and lift up our hearts to the Lord. Congregation of the Lord, where does our help come from? Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us praise our God with singing from hymn 54, stanzas 1, 3, 6, and 8. Let us now listen to the law of our God as we find it in the Ten Commandments, the law that God has given to his redeemed people to show us the way of thankfulness in how he has redeemed us and saved us and delivered us from our bondage to sin. Let us hear the law of God and respond to it thereafter from singing from Psalm 103, stanzas 3 and 4. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, 
but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Our Lord Jesus Christ, when he was asked, which commandment of these is the greatest, taught us the following summary of the law when he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. humble ourselves before God in prayer and seek his blessing over our worship this morning. Let us pray. Lord God and Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer this morning because you are the one and only God, the true God, the living and almighty God who has made the whole universe and every created thing and every living being out of nothing bringing all things into being through the power of your word. And not only did you create all things, but you also uphold all things with each passing day by your providential hand, so that nothing happens, not even a hair falls from our heads, apart from your will and your control. 
Lord, we stand in awe before you, before your majesty and glory and splendor and holiness. There is no God besides you and nothing can compare with you. Lord, you alone are worthy of worship and that is why we are gathered here this morning. Lord, we confess that too often we are not mindful of you. We are mindful of many things. Our minds are full. We pay careful attention to our own lives, to our own wants, our own desires, our own interests. We fill our minds with our work, our need to make a living, to sustain our lives. We are mindful of news and developments in our world and we also try to be tuned in to the needs of others around us, our families, our children, our friends. And yet, Lord, though we are mindful of so many things, yet so often we are not mindful of you. Indeed, sometimes we might go through a whole day or a whole week without noticing or acknowledging you. Father, we confess this is human arrogance on our part to forget you, to be inattentive towards you, to fail to see your greatness and your worth above all else. We confess there is nothing and no one that we need more than you and no idol, no construct that we form can ever give us what you alone can give. Lord, as we could hear your law read this morning, we confess that we have not been faithful in keeping your commandments. We have disobeyed you. We have failed to live in awe of you. We've chosen paths of self-reliance over and instead of the path that you have set out for us in your good and holy will. And as a result, Lord, we confess our sins of idolatry, of hostility and animosity towards you and towards our neighbor. We also confess our sins of greed and envy, murder and adultery, theft and coveting. Lord, we have fallen in so many ways and we know that you know all of our sins and shortcomings. And we are humbled by the awareness that our sins offend you and insult you and grieve you. And therefore, Father, we pray for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us. Forgive our sins through the costly blood that Jesus Christ poured out on the cross on our behalf. We thank you that in the fullness of time you sent your Son, born of woman, to redeem those of us who were under the law, under the curse of the law, under the prospect of just and eternal punishment of your wrath. And in light of this, we thank you for your amazing grace that by not sparing your Son from judgment, we could be spared from judgment eternally. And so, Father, we thank you that you have removed our sins from us as far as east separates from the west. And, Father, we pray that by your Spirit you will give us faith to embrace Christ's work for our salvation and by the power of your Spirit create new life in us that we may serve and glorify you every day. Father, help us all to see that you are always in control, always at the center of this universe, that you and your purposes are what gives this life meaning. Help us then always to look to you for what we need to grow in the knowledge and understanding of your word, that we may increasingly fear your name. And to this end, supply for all our needs, for body and soul, for you know our needs even better than we do ourselves. Thank you that because you know our needs, in your grace you have given us your word to guide us in the way we should go. Lord, we pray that you will open your word for us again this morning, unfold its truth to our hearts and minds, and give us understanding. Fill us once again with the treasures of your storehouses, so that we may go on our way rejoicing in your steadfast love and faithfulness, and in the glory of your grace. We may have strength to serve you in whatever you bring us in life, having the 
hope of eternal rest and peace and glory and blessing to carry us through this life and into the next. Lord, hear our prayer and bless us for we pray this all for Jesus' sake. Amen. As we prepare to open and read from God's Word, let us sing from Psalm 34, stanzas 1 and 4. I invite you now to turn with me in your Bibles to our scripture reading and text which is found in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. We will read together the first 15 verses. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, reading verses 1 to 15. Hear now God's holy and inspired word, the words of the preacher. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the busyness that, met, that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. 
Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceived that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceived that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear that, that people fear before him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. So far, our reading of God's word. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. After the proclamation of God's word, let us respond in song by singing from Psalm 103, census 6 and 7 following the sermon. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, boys and girls, are you aware of the time? Not the time on your watch or your clock or your phone or what have you, which would really be the least important thing when you are here in the house of God to hear God's word proclaimed. I mean, how aware are you of the concept of time? Of course, everyone is conscious of time. We are all aware of it, but when you really stop to think about it deeply, then you quickly realize that not many of us know much about time time. And that explains why philosophers and scientists have been fascinated by this subject, studying it for thousands of years. For as time marches on and progresses along, there is this repetitive succession or or sequence of events going from morning to afternoon to evening from daytime to nighttime before turning into morning once again. We all know that the past is, is swallowed up by the present, which is swallowed up by the future. Days become weeks, which become months, which become years, which become decades, which become centuries, which become millennia. Even this lovely summertime that we are currently enjoying will end. It will give way to fall, which will give way to winter, only to be replaced with spring, and summer will follow, if it be God's will. And on and on it goes, from one thing to the next, the progression and the passage of time. The question is, how should we respond to it? In the passing of time, is the passing of time a a recipe for living with reckless abandon, indulging in whatever this life can offer you, chasing after fun, chasing after pleasure and parties at any cost, because life is short, you know, and you never know if tomorrow will come. Or is the passing of time a reason for depression, thinking what's the point, what's the use? Well, the writer of Ecclesiastes wrestles with these questions and he wants us to see the meaning and the purpose in the regular day-to-day, moment-to-moment life, to make sense of human history and the daily events of life, and understand the times so that we will be equipped to live through them in the way that God would have us live through them. And so I proclaim the word of God to you this morning under the following theme. The preacher contemplates how to live wisely through various and diverse times. We'll see first the time's passage observed. Secondly, time's problem explained. First we see time's passage observed. Here in Ecclesiastes 3, the preacher, as he's referred to back in verse 1 of chapter 1, addresses the matter of time by way of of a poem made of 
contrasting parallels or a series of, of opposing uh, pairings dealing with the basic question, what is happening in this world? And these are familiar words in our text, perhaps some of the most well-known words in the whole Bible. Words made even more popular by the rock group, the birds in the 60s, in their song, Turn, Turn, Turn. But what we see in these words is that the preacher is not giving us here a, a directive, a command. Instead of being prescriptive, prescribing what we should do, he is simply being descriptive, simply describing what exists in this world. All these things happen, positive things and negative things. The question is, on whose timetable? Who's in control of the times? Or are they out of control? He says there is a time to be born and a time to die. In this way, the preacher is telling us to understand that this world is not under our control, but under God's control. For we are powerless to choose our birth date and our dying date. Even if we think that we can choose our dying date as some do, God knew it long before you ever did. This whole universe is under God's control and, he, and it operates on His timetable. He is sovereign and we are not. He ordains and appoints everything to happen at its appointed season or time. And the second contrast on the list is there to make the same point. There is a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. Planting and harvesting must each happen in their proper season at the right time of year. Farmers can tell you this. No point trying to plant in the middle of winter, minus 40, or harvesting in the spring, Apart from the strange exception of this year, of course, you have to pardon the preacher, wise as he was, even he didn't, did not see that coming. But the point here is that planting and reaping seasons happen at the times that God has set for them. That's why farmers are most uptight and anxious at those times in the year. For they realize that it all depends on factors outside of their control. They must rely on the Lord to guide and bless. And from there, the preacher goes on to cover the vast experiences of life. There is a time to weep, he says. Not because you decide today or tomorrow I'm going to weep. No, God in his providence brings such events into our lives that cause us to weep and to mourn. And conversely, there is a time to laugh and to dance. For there are these other times, even sometimes mid-seasons of weeping, where we can laugh. And God brings those circumstances about as well. A time for casting away stones and a time for gathering them together. That seems to be a reference to how invading or departing armies would, would dump rocks on fields as they would come or go in order to disrupt the ability to farm the land until the rocks had been cleared and removed and the field was free of rocks once again. A time to keep and a time to cast away, knowing when to invest and when to divest, knowing when to hold them and knowing when to fold them. By way of all these contrasts, mankind is put in his place in the back seat, not the driver's seat. These verses, therefore, ought to produce great humility in us as we recognize that in spite of all our careful planning and strategizing, we are not in control, but God is. In all these situations listed here, and I, I won't go through them all for the sake of time, but I leave them to you to ponder over lunch. In all of these contrasts, the preacher paints the picture of reality 
in a fallen world. He's not living in some fantasy world where everything is rainbows and butterflies and unicorns. Notice that he does not only make the things that you would scrapbook and put in a photo album and post on Facebook for all your friends to see. He is aware that both positives and negatives exist in this world. He understands the truth captured in the wedding vows. For better or worse, in good days and bad, in riches and poverty, in health and sickness, to be true to you always, to be faithful to the vows that are made at a marriage. So also here in Ecclesiastes, alongside the 14 positives are 14 negatives that seem to cancel out the positives and leave us with the remainder of a big fat zero. Nothing to gain. Futility. And so the question is asked in verse 9 following this list, what gain, what gain has the worker from his toil? It seems like it's all going nowhere. You work so that you have money, so that you can eat, so that you can have strength and energy, so that you can work, so that you can have money, so that you can eat and have strength and energy to work. That's the problem the preacher wants to flag for us. But thankfully, he is not one who simply wants to identify problems, or some people like that, but he also wants to, to show us the way through them, which leads us now to our second point, time's problem explained. Well, perhaps you noticed in verses 1 through 9, the preacher's observations of the various and diverse details of life that nowhere is there any mention of God. The preacher leaves him out of the picture for the sake of making a point. He looks at this mystery of time through the lens of, of a humanistic perspective, concentrating his attention only on what is under the sun, under heaven. The common phrase he uses in the book of Ecclesiastes. And after he has covered the scope of what this world minus God is all about, he reaches the point of exasperation in, in, in verse 9. He holds up his hands as if to say, what is it all worth? Is there meaning in all of this futility? And it is at this point in verse 10 and following that he, he reinserts God back in the equation. Even though, of course, God was there all along, governing every day, every detail, being so intimately familiar with us that not even a, a hair falls from our heads to the ground apart from his will and apart from his knowledge. For there is more to this world than only what can be seen and experienced, tasted and touched here below under the sun. There is a God in heaven. And only when we are mindful of him can we find meaning. Only faith in God can give us direction out of futility and futile ways of thinking. About God, the preacher says in verses 10 and 11, He has given to the children of man what they have to be busy with. He made heaven, uh, made everything beautiful in its time. He also put eternity into man's heart. In other words, God gives life. He made this life. He gives breath. He keeps the heart that He gave you and He made, He created. He keeps it going, beat after beat after beat. God orders all human affairs. God makes everything beautiful despite the repetitive and seemingly cyclical nature of everything that happens. But while nothing seems to be lasting or permanent and and our stamp on this world seems no more than a, a soft imprint that will be forgotten soon after we leave. 
like a footprint on the beach before the waves come and, and wipe it all away. There is more to the story. There's an overarching story that God has, has put eternity into man's heart. This has often been helpfully described in terms of a, a tapestry as it is being sewn, woven together. On the one side, it is, it is unclear how the, how the threads are, are being woven together to form a wonderful picture. It seems rather chaotic. The events of, of life from our perspective seem to be disconnected and a disjointed mess. Some things in life seem to get in the way of things that we had hoped for or had expected or had intended. And we look at certain things in life as obstacles and accidents. But in the providence of God, there are no such things as accidents. You may think of it this way, that in God's dictionary, in the Christian vocabulary, there is no word or concept of an accident. Rather, all things, be it death, sickness, cancer, depression, miscarriage, infertility, financial hardship, heartbreak, are all fitting together somehow, some way, into that perfect tapestry, which will only become clear to you, at least in part, when we leave this time-bound world and enter into eternity to come. And God gives us to know what he wants us to know. Then it will be apparent that all things were working together for my salvation, your salvation. God has put eternity into our hearts so that we cannot fathom this world, we cannot make sense of this world without understanding that there is more to it that there is something bigger than ourselves. The meaning of life is therefore not something we can access or manufacture on our own, but rather it is something beyond us, above us, outside of us, outside of this world. Eternity in our hearts hints to us that we were made for a different world, a world where we dwell with God in perfect peace and purity and fellowship. This is the insight that we can only have by faith. No human being can, can figure this out through any measure of their own wisdom and their own intelligence and their own ingenuity and by any amount of their own resources that they pour into it. It takes faith, it takes belief in the Word of God to see that blessing comes from God's hand just as, as well as sorrow. Teaching us to be thankful in prosperity and patient in adversity and having a firm confidence as we view the future that no creature shall separate us from His love. That's what we confess in Lord's 9 and 10 about God's fatherly care and providence. How does this shape how we live then? Well, this impacts how we approach our work, says the writer, the preacher of, in Ecclesiastes. You see, the preacher did not wrap up his teaching on the subject of work at verse 9 and, and leave it there. No, he, he comes back to it and he revisits it again in verse 13 where he says, everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. In other words, fitting it inside the context of God's rule and dominion, he is saying, get busy, be joyful, be energetic and, and industrious with what God has given you in, in gratitude to God who made you for this world, who put you in this world in order that you would be useful and that you would find pleasure and purpose in serving Him right in the place and position that He has placed you here and now. When the preacher says there is nothing better than to be joyful and to do good as, as long as they live, 
this is not an attitude of, of resignation, as some have thought. He is not saying, I wish there was something better to life, but there isn't. So the best thing you can do is accept that, grin and bear it, make the best of a bad situation. Though the preacher uses positive terms, he speaks about the good things of life, like eating and drinking, having joy and doing good. He's not settling for second best, but he's telling us that there is meaning and joy to be found in the regular things of everyday life when viewed in the perspective of God and how to serve him. He's, not say, he, he's saying don't fall into the temptation to view this life as an end in itself, but view it all in relation to God and your perspective will be radically different. And so the preacher adds in verse 14, I perceived what, that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nothing taken from it. God has done it so that people might fear him. That really sums up our life's calling and purpose, doesn't it? In light of the time that is fleeting away, a vapor, a mist, here today, gone tomorrow, in the midst of this world, fear God. In spite of whatever is happening in this world, good or bad, beautiful or ugly, fear God. As you live in the here and now, in the daily grind, in the ebb and flow of life, fear God. Now living in the fear of God is not to be understood as living in terror or, or frightened of God. Uh, rather, to fear God is, is one of the most positive statements in the whole Bible. It means to let God be God. To be in awe of Him. To be filled with reverence towards Him. To devote yourselves completely to Him. To engage wholeheartedly in the work of the church and His kingdom. To fear God is to be in utter amazement of all that He is and all that He has said and all that He has done. And the scriptures are full of, of reasons to fear God. From the reality of His presence, His existence, to the reality of his power, to the reality of his authority over all things, to the reality of his character. And the greatest reason of all to fear him is because of how he graciously intervened into this fallen world by sending his son Jesus Christ in the fullness of time in order that just at the right time the godly would die for the ungodly so that we could be reconciled to God. What more reason could we have to be in fear and in awe of God? For this puts everything else in its proper place. What we have no answers for, God has the answer. And so the fear of God makes the fear of anything else the such as the fear of men, or the fear of success, or the fear of having all the answers, the fear of having all, your life perfectly together. The fear of God outweighs all those things. The fear of God takes the air out of those things that we tend to inflate so that we learn to not rely on them to hold us up and to carry us when life gets tough, but so that we look to God, who alone is powerful and willing to hold us up and carry us through to the end. And so, brothers and sisters, our text this morning is ultimately calling us to place our trust in God, nowhere else. With Him, there is no room for fatalism or despair. With Him, there is no reason to worry or be afraid of what life has brought or, or may bring your way. For God is the God of all time and space. 
He is the almighty and ever-present God who brought all things into their existence and he governs them at all times. Our hope is found in him and our help comes from him. As we confess again this morning, as we do every Sunday, at the beginning of our worship service, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Apart from him... Our life is vain and empty and hollow. Ecclesiastes shows us that very clearly. And so of all the people on the earth then who, who, know, that, who know that in Jesus Christ, as you do, that all things were made beautiful once again through him, we have every reason to fear him and worship him and live for Him, redeeming the time that He gave us, giving it back to Him so that we may enjoy the gift of life, even eternal life already today. Amen. In our congregational prayer this morning, we will remember that this week our sister Klaska Boltina will, Lord willing, celebrate another birthday tomorrow. We'll also give thanks that brothers Lauren Vanessen and brother Jeremy Huxima could undergo successful surgeries uh, this past week. Uh, for brother Vanessen, that was back surgery for Brother Huxma, there was a hernia surgery, and both appear to be on the road to recovery. We'll give thanks to the Lord for that. With these matters in mind, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we stand amazed at the mysteries that you unfold for us in your word. Lord, as time goes by, so many things happen in this universe, and we do not have answers or explanations for why they happen as they do. And yet, Lord, we pray that we may be content in knowing that all that you have given us to know, Lord, we could be reminded this morning that nothing happens by chance, 
but that all things come to us from your fatherly hand, under your sovereign control, and in accordance with your holy will. Lord, help us to see that all things are therefore working together for our salvation in Jesus Christ. Strengthen our faith and trust in Him and in your promises to us through Him. And so, Father, fill our lives with the meaning that you intend for us, that we may devote our lives to your service and be faithful and busy with our work as those who are working for you. And so fill us with joy and grant us humility and awe as we live before you and as we live for you. Lord, it is our prayer that you will bless your people, every member of this congregation gathered here this morning, as well as those who are away, in particular those who could not be here due to age or state of health or circumstances of life. Father, be with them that they may experience your blessing and your presence in a special way on this day. Father, be with those also who willfully have chosen not to be here today in worship. Awaken in them the reality that this life is short, that this life is empty and futile without you. Father, we pray for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. Give them strength to go on from day to day in the power of the gospel and in the news of Christ's victory over sin and death and the grave. We pray for those who are sick and those who are battling pain and chronic illness of body or mind. We pray for our brothers, Lauren Vanessen and Jeremy Hooksema, upon their respective surgeries. We thank you that their surgeries could happen and that they could go successfully. And, that we, and we pray that you will be pleased to bless the results, that they may be given new, renewed strength and the experience of the gift of good health. Lord, we thank you that if it be your will, this coming week our sister Klaska Boltina may celebrate another birthday. Lord, we thank you for your care over her in the past year. A busy year, a tough year. Also, as it related to the passing of her husband, Bert, whom you took home to be with you. Lord, we pray that along with the gift of gospel comfort, you will also grant her a special time of celebration with family, with friends, as they together rejoice in your blessings and in your good gifts. Father, we also pray, will you be with your people worldwide, those especially whom you have called to endure persecution, grant strength, grant perseverance to those who suffer because they bear the name of Christ. Uphold them and sustain them and keep their eyes focused upon Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despised the shame, and who is now seated at your right hand in heavenly glory. Father, we pray for this world, this world which is filled with so much trouble, so much pain and suffering, we pray for the poor and the hungry, the disabled. Father, in your infinite mercy, care for their needs and carry them through their afflictions. Grant relief and encouragement, most especially as you open eyes and ears and hearts to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the only source of light in the midst of darkness the only source of life in a world characterized by death and decay, the only source of meaning in a world full of confusion and hollow philosophies. Father, to that end, we pray for all the work of mission and evangelism. Gather many people toward yourself and bring them into the fold of your church so that they may be faithful and fruitful and living members of your body under one head, Jesus Christ. 
Father, we pray for all who bear responsibility for government in this country. May they promote your justice in society. May they especially promote the safety and the well-being of the weak and of the helpless and not cater to what is most popular or what is most politically advantageous for the day. We pray that you will also preserve the freedom to worship you and, and the laws and protections set in place to prevent disruption or disturbance of worship services. Lord, bless every righteous endeavor in the political realm and cause those efforts to succeed. But if it be your will that those efforts should fail or fall on deaf ears, then enable us to see that our appeals must go directly to you as the one who is the ultimate protector, the one who is seated on the highest of all thrones, the one who hears our every petition and works all things for our good. Father, we thank you for this day of rest, this foretaste of the eternal rest that awaits your people. Give us all great joy and thankfulness as we celebrate this rest already today in part, and as we look forward to the glory of what awaits us because of your grace in Jesus Christ. Father, hear our prayer and bless now the offering that we will bring. In Jesus' great and glorious name we pray. Amen. The Lord now gives you opportunity to worship him through the offering of your gifts. And the offering this morning is for the work of the deacons among the needy. Let us then after the offering give... Praise to God in our final song from hymn 66, Great is Thy Faithfulness, all stanzas.
lift up your hearts now and receive the blessing of the Lord as we make our way from here in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.